we'll get started. So welcome everybody um, to, to our talk today, um, to the Friedman Family Visiting Professional uh, Program talk. Um, uh, this will be hosted by uh, ERI, GISO, and the Geotech Seminars. Um, and so uh, today we'll be uh, hosting Mr. John Thornley. He's an associate and senior geotechnical engineer at Golder Associates in Anchorage, Alaska. He has over 15 years of geotechnical and earthquake engineering experience. So recently, John was co-lead for the EERI Learning from Earthquake Reconnaissance effort for the 2018 magnitude 7.1 Anchorage, Alaska earthquake. Uh, John is currently the chair of the Municipality of Anchorage Geotechnical Advisory Commission. He served as a field manager of, uh, of geotechnical studies and prepared recommendations for a variety of infrastructure projects, including buildings, roads, and airports, large liquefied natural gas and water storage tanks, pipelines, winds, cellular towers, and utilities. So a lot of stuff. Um, as part of John's work, he's been involved in seismic hazard studies, seismic site response analyses, studies for large infrastructural build out and cold regions and permafrost engineering. Um, his design work includes ground improvement of liquefiable soils, deep and shallow foundations, slope stabilization, retaining structures and embankments. And so um, without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. John Thornley. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, happy to be here from uh, Anchorage, Alaska, where it's uh, a touch cold today, but uh, uh, still uh, still fairly uh, fairly nice day. The sun's uh, just coming up now, and uh, and it looks uh, looks quite nice out there. So happy to be here today. I'm really excited uh, uh, to finally be able to uh, present to you. I was uh, scheduled to uh, present last year as well, uh, but due to uh, COVID and and those things, and and you know just getting familiar with. Uh, 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 you know, sharing by the web, uh, we uh, we decided to postpone, and here we are, uh, one year later, uh, sharing by web. So, <laughs> um, looking forward to uh, you know being with you in person uh, at some point. Uh, but uh, happy to be here uh, today. I'd like to also uh, thank the uh, Friedman family for their uh, generous endowment uh, to make uh, uh, things like this happen and presentations like this happen. Um, so a couple of slides or a few slides about uh, ERI, uh, just to uh, uh, give you some uh, sense for uh, who ERI is, if you're not a, not a member. Um, it was established in 1948, and it's uh, not, just, uh, not just a bunch of engineers, uh, but uh, uh, geoscientists, social scientists, architects, uh, uh, you name it. It's uh, got a wide variety of, of, uh, of disciplines uh, that we're all uh, working to uh, reduce earthquake risk. Um, and so earthquakes affect a, a, a variety of uh, areas. And, uh, and uh, so it takes, uh, takes a whole, whole team. Uh, mission and statement is, uh, of ERI is to redu reduce earthquake risk um, by advancing the science and, uh, and the practice of earthquake engineering. And uh, we'll be talking about that uh, a bit today. Um, and then improving the understanding of impacts of earthquakes on physical, social, economic, political, and cultural environment, and advocating comprehensive and realistic measures uh, for reducing uh, the harmful effects of earthquakes. Um, so why ERI? Um, it, why, why become a member if you aren't, or why to continue your membership if you are? Um, is, uh, it's a great opportunity to connect uh, and uh, meet uh, different people. Um, across a variety of disciplines and uh, and learn from them and then uh, uh, help uh, you know help your uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, fellow people with uh, with um, earthquake risk reduction. Um, and then how do you get involved or how did I get involved uh, with ERI? Uh, so I I was uh, uh, an ERI member back in in graduate school and and uh, where I was at the University of Nevada Reno. And and you know we did uh, some student chapter things and it was uh, it was interesting but I I, I kind of stayed on uh, ERI afterwards mostly because I really liked Earthquake Spectra the journal um, and I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, reading reading the articles in that um, and and I didn't do a lot necessarily directly with ERI until uh, the 2010 uh, Haiti earthquake uh, there was a call out for. Um, essentially, uh, virtual uh, uh, support uh, for the earthquake teams uh, that were looking at uh, damage uh, due to the earthquake, 
and uh, and they would send you they'd send you little maps of uh, aerial photos of uh, of damaged buildings, and you'd draw little polygons around the ones that were fully damaged, uh, and a different polygon around the ones that uh, looked like they were partially damaged, and um, then left. Uh, as I recall, it's uh, you know about a decade ago now. Um, you'd uh, you'd uh, leave the the ones that uh, weren't damaged alone, and and so by that, uh, it you know a, a team of uh, of us all sitting at our homes, we were able to uh, support uh, ERI in in estimating uh, the amount of damage uh, that uh, that had uh, been caused, and it was it was a really neat experience. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of nights uh, uh, clicking around on on these uh, aerial photos and and uh, and helping that. Uh, uh, but uh, but it kind of got me uh, reinvigorated with ERI, um, and so we actually have the Alaska chapter of uh, ERI, and uh, I'm a board member on on that chapter, um, and and we're uh, in the process of kind of re re stirring that into motion, um, and and making it a, a more active uh, and uh, advocacy driven um, chapter uh, to help uh, with. Uh, engineering uh, and earthquake engineering uh, policy changes uh, within the state of Alaska. So it's pretty pretty neat opportunities. Uh, but uh, that's kind of been my journey with ERI, and I do make it to uh, uh, fairly regularly the the annual meetings. Uh, just had one a couple weeks ago um, that was of course virtual, but uh, it was really well done, and uh, um, I'm looking forward to uh, future um, uh, future presentations and, and annual meetings. Um, so again, uh, who are ERA members, uh, geoscientists, engineers, uh, um, and a whole wide variety of, uh, of, of people, uh, scientists, practicing professionals, professors, educators, government officials, building code regulators, uh, you name it, uh, a wide, uh, wide variety of uh, folks. Um, then uh, there's a, a number of initiatives uh, that, uh, that are a part of uh, ERI's core. Uh, the school earthquake safety initiative, uh, you know, as, as we all know, uh, in, in uh, the U.S., uh, school is compulsory. So uh, schools and, and prisons are, are uh, kind of our own only compulsory structures. So we require uh, kids to be in school all day. So let's make those uh, schools safe. And, uh, um, and you know, a, a personal story on that, uh, we, um, we had a magnitude 7.1 earthquake in 2018, um, and uh, we had some structural damage, but most of the damage was related to uh, non-structural elements and uh, ceiling tiles falling down, um, uh, interior pipes breaking and, and leaking, um, a, a whole variety of uh, issues. But uh, one of the one of the excellent things that came out of it was uh, this, there were uh, I think one or two injuries in the schools. Um, as, as a result of the earthquake, it, but the majority of, uh, 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 it could have been a lot worse had uh, they not been trained to uh, drop and, and hide underneath their desks and hold on to their desks um, because uh, ceiling tiles they were coming down could have uh, easily hurt uh, the students, but they, they're, they're training uh, through um, uh, safe, uh, you know, these safe school initiatives and, uh, and other things uh, really, really helped to keep them safe. So, uh, you know, I think this is a, a great program uh, by ERI. Um, learning from earthquakes, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, I, I helped lead a, a team uh, on the learning from earthquakes program for that magnitude 7.1 uh, event uh, here in Anchorage. And uh, that was a really neat experience. And we should be publishing our learning from earthquakes report here in the next uh, few weeks. Um, there's a, uh, an LFE travel program, so it uh, lets you uh, spend a, a week in the field um, uh, in earthquake affected regions around the world, and that's a pretty neat um, uh, option and opportunity. Uh, so I, I'd recommend looking into, into that um, if uh, the opportunity arise, arises. There's a, a trip to Chile and a trip to New Zealand uh, that uh, was funded by this program. Um, so neat, uh, neat opportunities there. So keep, uh, uh, keep your eye out for that. Uh, the student membership benefits. Uh, this, this program, the Friedman Family Visiting uh, Professionals Program. Um, then there's the ERI competitions, and a number of you are, are uh, taking part in, in that, uh, uh, the seismic design and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, travel grants uh, and uh, online access to earthquake spectra. Again, a, a great, uh, great uh, uh, journal. Um, 
So what can you do after graduation? So there's the Student Leadership Council. Uh, there's the Younger Members Committee or the Young Members Committee, uh, ERI Professional uh, Regional Chapter, uh, like the one in Alaska that I mentioned earlier. And, uh, and then uh, Seismic Design Competition, you can still be involved in that um, and, and a number of other, uh, other activities. Um, so, uh, you know, there is, uh, there is life in ERI after graduation and, and uh, I've, I've found that and have uh, really enjoyed it and uh, I hope you do as well. Um, so here's a number of regional chapters that exist. So um, depending on where you end up after, after school, uh, you'll, uh, you'll have some opportunities there uh, to, uh, to join, a, join a regional chapter or if you're in an area that doesn't uh, start your own chapter. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of uh, neat opportunities there. Um, uh, then uh, uh, as, a, as a nice little uh, 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 teaser out there, uh, student members get uh, the first year of uh, young professional membership free and then the next four years uh, are at reduced rates to kind of help you uh, you're you're working on uh, on, on loans and and uh, you know getting uh, you know getting your feet back under you um, and uh, and that so this is uh, an opportunity to uh, join at a reduced rate and uh, and um, uh, keep active in the ERI so so www.eri.org uh, is uh, the uh, website and, uh, and I highly encourage you to do that. And I am looking forward to uh, continuing to uh, uh, meet with you all, especially when we get back into person uh, meetings uh, at, uh, at maybe next year's annual meeting. So thanks again for, for having me. And uh, without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll move into uh, the presentation. So this, uh, this presentation, um, I'm going to discuss uh, kind of the seismic hazard across Alaska and, uh, and I'll advocate for a case uh, for updating the, the hazard model uh, that, uh, we, that we use for the, the codes uh, related to uh, engineering work uh, um, in Alaska. Um, little outline, uh, we'll just kind of talk about uh, uh, the overview um, and seismicity along with uh, uh, how we do seismic hazard analyses. And I've kept it uh, pretty high level. Uh, haven't gone into uh, the nitty gritty details, but, uh, but um, uh, I have uh, some, uh, some uh, slides about just the process of, of how you actually do a seismic hazard analysis. Um, and then uh, a number of uh, case studies and, uh, and some uh, concluding remarks. Um, so just, uh, just to hit on some notable Alaska earthquakes, uh, in 1964, we had the Great Alaska Earthquake. Um, it's the second largest earthquake uh, that's been uh, observed uh, in, in modern times. Um, uh, it's uh, magnitude 9.2. Uh, it was a fairly large uh, earthquake, uh, a very large earthquake, uh, and, and uh, caused uh, widespread damage across uh, South Central Alaska. Um, then in 2002, the Denali earthquake uh, was magnitude 7.9, was the largest um, largest inland earthquake uh, in the U.S. in, in 150 years. Um, so it was a it's a fairly fairly large and devastating event. Um, 2016, the Inniskin, Inniskin earthquake uh, was magnitude 7.1, um, and uh, then as I mentioned, uh, 2018 we had a magnitude 7.1 earthquake just north of Anchorage. Um, and then 2020 Siminoff uh, earthquake, uh, it was a magnitude 7.8. And we'll talk just a touch on, on why I've highlighted these uh, five earthquakes because uh, there are quite a number of uh, earthquakes that, uh, uh, that, uh, that occur um, uh, in, in Alaska. So uh, why these five? And um, let's see, so uh, uh, the great Alaska earthquake, 1964, on, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, this is uh, the, the city of, uh, um, of Kodiak. And uh, you can see this boat's uh, not in the water anymore. Uh, this was, uh, Kodiak was damaged uh, significantly due to a tsunami following uh, the uh, earthquake. Um, here down in downtown Anchorage, Alaska, there, this is a, a person standing there for scale and uh, roughly about uh, 10 feet to 12 feet of uh, vertical drop of this Robin, uh, wide widespread damage uh, across uh, Anchorage, um, 
and uh, significant uh, 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 damage that uh, that, is, that uh, was caused there. Uh, the 64 earthquake shook strongly for about four uh, four to five minutes, um, and so it's. Uh, I mean, if you think about, we've been talking now for for about 15 minutes, so a third of that time, the the ground was uh, just shaking strongly under your feet. A pretty pretty substantial uh, earthquake event. Um, then the uh, 2002 Denali earthquake. Uh, that one uh, caused uh, widespread uh, damage. Uh, we have the Trans Alaska Pipeline here. And there was about 14 feet of, uh, of vertical or, or not vertical, but uh, horizontal uh, uh, movement uh, from uh, from one side to the other. And and you can see that there there are rails here. Uh, this this uh, pipeline was uh, was built in the late 1970s, and they knew that the fault came through here, the Denali fault. Um, and so what they did was they put uh, this pipeline on. Uh, these uh, Teflon uh, uh, shoes on top of these rails, and uh, in case uh, there was a deformation of uh, of that uh, fault, and what you see here is about 14 feet of uh, of movement because of the fault um, related to that 2002 Denali earthquake, and so uh, this uh, uh, this uh, system worked as designed, and uh, uh, the pipeline was able to continue to uh, uh, to be used. Um, so fairly substantial uh, earthquake, and, uh, and it shows uh, that uh, you know good engineering uh, can uh, can really go a long way for you. Uh, the the 2016 Inniskin earthquake, uh, it was about 300 kilometers or so from from Anchorage. Um, there was some uh, light non-structural damage in Anchorage. Uh, uh, this uh, unfortunately there was a house uh, that uh, the gas line uh, ruptured. Um, and and uh, the house caught fire and burned down, but this was the only uh, real uh, significant damage of that earthquake. Um, but the reason I bring the Inniskin earthquake up is there was uh, lots of discussion uh, related to preparedness for big earthquakes after that, um, that uh, that really helped uh, prepare us at least uh, at least uh, um, in uh, evaluating our you know evaluating our preparedness uh, for uh, the magnitude. Uh, uh, 7.1 uh, 2018 Anchorage earthquake, uh, which did actually cause a uh, fairly widespread damage. Um, here's a, a famous uh, picture. This is an off ramp uh, uh, going to the airport, and uh, and this car got uh, got stuck there. Um, and, and these people are actually on their way to the airport, and somebody uh, actually picked them up and gave them a ride uh, so they could catch their plane. And they left their keys here. And uh, when the DOT was able to repair the road, they they moved the car out of the way. Um, uh, we also saw uh, in areas where uh, where maybe the the uh, engineered fill was not uh, placed as as good as it could be. Uh, we saw uh, significant damage uh, to homes and and to uh, other other structures. Um, and so it uh, really highlighted uh, one of the one of the highlights from the 2018 earthquake is how effective the the codes are. Um, at uh, at providing a, a safe uh, uh, safe structures uh, for uh, during earthquakes um, and uh, and there were plenty of examples of uh, of homes and other buildings that uh, were not up to code um, or may have not been inspected um, that uh, didn't uh, didn't fare as well so um, then I, I threw in here the uh, Simeonov earthquake uh, and and mostly uh, because uh, what this earthquake highlights is that we're still learning uh, from earthquakes, uh, uh, still significant learning to, uh, to be had. Um, so this is the, the Aleutians, and this is where the uh, Pacific plate is subducting underneath the North American plate. And uh, this was the rupture path from the 1964 earthquake, or rupture area from the 1964 earthquake. And, and what we've had is we've had all of these zones along here uh, rupture. And so there's there's been this question about this, uh, what we call the Schumagin, Schumagin Gap. Um, and, and nobody really understood why the Schumagin Gap historically had not ruptured. Um, um, and, you know, was, was this patch, you know, something uh, kind of, a, of an anomaly. And what, what this uh, earthquake in 2020 actually shows us is that uh, our, our understanding of, of earthquakes is uh, still fairly short uh, with, with respect to uh, historical data collection. 
and and the Schubinger Gap was just uh, just uh, waiting to actually happen, um, and uh, and rather than uh, some anomaly uh, that uh, that was a, as was occurring on the the uh, Aleutian chain. There's more. Again, this was July of 2020, so there's more research to be had about this, but uh, it does help fill in our our understanding of uh, of how. Uh, the the mega thrust subduction zone earthquakes uh, uh, behave and and you know some of their their patterns and and uh, and that so uh, even in even in 2020 we're still uh, learning uh, uh, significant information about about earthquakes which is kind of the undercurrent uh, of uh, of today's presentation. Um, so Alaska is actually a fairly uh, seismically active uh, state. Uh, there's uh, in in uh, 2020 alone, uh, there were over 50,000 uh, recorded earthquakes by the Alaska Earthquake Center, uh, and so this is a map of just the seismicity from uh, from 2020 alone, um, and and we have a number of, uh, for instance, the 2018 earthquake. Uh, there's a number of uh, of aftershocks from from that earthquake, uh, you know, thousands of aftershocks. Uh, and, and some of them we even get to feel, um, uh, you know, a lot of these are, are magnitude one and two earthquakes, so they're not uh, significant from an engineering standpoint, um, but, uh, but uh, we, we definitely live in earthquake country up here uh, in Alaska, uh, which makes it a great uh, uh, laboratory uh, for uh, earthquake engineering. Um, just to give you a sense for what uh, what on a, on a daily scale, uh, the number of earthquakes per day, you can see this is a hundred earthquakes per day uh, line and you can see that we get uh, uh, fairly substantial uh, uh, numbers of earthquakes across the state. Now, uh, just kind of going back this this length here uh, from top to bottom of, uh, of Alaska, if you will, uh, is uh, roughly 800 miles. Uh, so, um, it's a, it's a fairly sizable state. Um, so when you have an earthquake up here, down here in in uh, Anchorage, uh, you don't necessarily feel it. And when you have uh, you know a, a, even a large earthquake down on the Aleutian chain, um, it's still quite a quite a long ways from uh, from Anchorage. Um, so uh, there's uh, every and every ten years or so, nine to eleven years, uh, there's a magnitude seven uh, earthquake um, on the mega thrust. Uh, we had, uh, as I said before, 50,000 earthquakes. Um, in 2018, there were 55,000. Uh, in 2019, there were just over 50,000. And in 2020, there were 50,000. So it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty substantial. Um, the Anchorage earthquake still averages about 26 uh, aftershocks a week. Um, and so, and those are mostly small, mostly ones you don't feel, but, uh, but it's a uh, uh, fairly, uh, um, uh, active uh, uh, region. And just yesterday we had a, a magnitude 5.7 that was roughly uh, what 220 kilometers north of uh, of Anchorage and um, I, I felt it in my house. It was 920 uh, local time um, and uh, and felt the house shaking as I was uh, as I was working from home. So it's a it's a great earth, earthquake laboratory in Alaska. Uh, so, so you know, how does how does uh, how do we get from uh, all these earthquakes to uh, safe structures? Um, and so, it uh, requires uh, members of of the team uh, that uh, include uh, engineering seismologists who characterize the faults and and develop uh, the the seismicity models, uh, geotechnical engineers who evaluate the ground motions and uh, and uh, local uh, site effects and soil behavior. Um, and then the structural engineers that uh, then uh, from ground up uh, uh, provide us uh, safe structures to, to live and work in. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, the uh, major components for, you know, for how an earthquake actually affects us. We have the source and path. Uh, so you have the earthquake uh, uh, source and then it, it uh, travels some path uh, to get to our site. And these are primarily uh, evaluated by the, the engineering seismologist. Um, then you have the site effects, and that's uh, where the geotechnical engineer comes uh, comes into play, and then uh, the structure, uh, where uh, where the structural engineer uh, comes into play. And so uh, that team, uh, you know, is able to translate uh, uh, earthquake behavior uh, from the source to uh, the site and the structure. 
Um, now, now, why do we care uh, so much about uh, uh, you know about how these earthquakes behave? Um, and and really, you know, what, what one thing that was learned from the 2018 Anchorage earthquake it wasn't necessarily learned, but it was felt was depending on where you're at uh, uh, in in the city, you're going to feel a different shaking. Um, for example, I was here in my office. Um, and uh, when the when the earthquake struck, and my my wife was at home preparing to preparing to go to work, and uh, and it shook uh, very violently at our, our home, but I I didn't feel much of it at all. As a matter of fact, uh, very few things fell off the shelves, and and it was kind of no big deal. And then when the news reports started uh, uh, coming out that uh, schools were closing, you need to go pick up your kids and and uh, and get them home, and and uh, it was pretty significant damage, uh, non-structural again. Um, it was I was kind of like, uh, why? What's the, what's the big deal? But uh, it really depends on on what the ground uh, below you uh, uh, shakes like. And to uh, to highlight uh, highlight that, um, here's a, a response spectrum. Uh, based on on different periods, uh, uh, fundamental frequencies, if you will, and and when you're sitting on a uh, a rock site, this is from the Loma Prieta earthquake. When you're sitting on a rock site, uh, your uh, spectral acceleration, your your strong shaking, uh, feels uh, feels like this. Uh, but uh, when you're on a soft soil site, um, you have this uh, significant amplification. And just to uh, just give you a sense for what that uh, really means. Um, if you were in a 10-story building, 10-story uh, building, um, n divided by 10, n being the number of stories, uh, 10 divided by 10 is 1. Uh, so a, a dumb geotechnical engineer's estimate of the fundamental frequency of a structure uh, will say that it's a, a one, second, uh, one second structure. And so if you had that same building on rock versus on soil, uh, you'd have uh, roughly, uh, you know, uh, 0.12 or so uh, g's of, of acceleration um, for for that building. But uh, if you were on rock, it would be over 0.5. Um, so that's uh, if you were on soil, it would be over 0.5. And so that's a fairly uh, significant uh, uh, change. Again, depending on uh, where that structure is built. Um, and so uh, understanding how that uh, uh, that behavior is is a, is a critical. A uh, piece of uh, of uh, why um, uh, why we do what we do. Uh, so so why do we care? You know this is the uh, this is a picture of uh, our photo from Anchorage, and this was uh, from the 1964 earthquake. Uh, we had uh, some significant uh, uh, slope uh, retrogressive failure of slopes, where you can actually see these are trees, and and there's uh, there's material out here. From this slide uh, that went out a half a mile into uh, the the inlet, uh, into the ocean uh, from uh, from this uh, earthquake, and again it was you know four to five minutes of, of strong shaking, and so after about minute two or so, uh, that's when slopes started failing, and and then they would continue to fail. Um, so I'm focusing on on Alaska earthquakes uh, today, um, but uh, you know as as we all know, we have earthquakes uh, all around all around the globe. Um, and there's a, a variety of uh, building practices and, you know, are we ready and are we prepared for the, the next big earthquake in, in whatever region um, that we're living? Um, so this is a, a pretty, uh, pretty significant question. And so it, 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 we answer it by, uh, by design. And so uh, by, uh, by design, uh, we, uh, we are attempting to design structures so that they survive. Um, and, the, and the code is actually the minimum standard of care uh, to reduce loss of life. And so we've, we've uh, recently kind of changed that uh, to a 1% uh, uh, probability of collapse um, within the code. And, uh, and, what, and that attempt is to make it so that uh, you, your, your uh, structure may not be habitable after you have a significant earthquake, uh, but you can get out of that structure because it doesn't uh, collapse on you. Um, and so that's uh, that's the the goal right now of of uh, the code is this minimum standard to make sure that you can actually get out of that structure um, after the earthquake and it doesn't collapse on you. Um, and a lot of people aren't aware of that, uh, but that's a you know that's a, a fundamental 
uh, uh, you know, piece of the code. And so when, when somebody complains about uh, having to uh, build to the code, you can just remind them that this is the minimum standard that uh, we, we use in, in engineering. Um, and and they, they should be potentially considering to make things more robust. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, we're also looking at uh, resilience of, of structures and lifelines uh, so that uh, we can get quickly back on our feet after, after a large earthquake. Um, and, and so that requires building actually above the minimum standard of care uh, for certain facilities. You can think about pipelines, uh, 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 utilities, uh, roadways, uh, hospitals, uh, you know, these uh, critical lifeline facilities uh, need to be designed so that uh, they're, they're ready to uh, uh, be used uh, in, in short order after an earthquake. Um, so there, there are essentially three levels of care uh, when, you, when you design. There's the code level, which again is that minimum standard. Um, then there's, uh, uh, and, and this is to understand the, the hazard um, uh, and, and, and provide good engineering for the hazard. So you've got the code level, you can go to the code. Uh, you've got uh, seismic hazard analyses, and you know it's pretty cheap to go to the code because it's already written. Uh, doing your seismic hazard analysis, which is what we'll be talking about today, uh, costs a little bit more money. And then if you uh, you know have a really important structure, uh, like say a nuclear facility, um, you uh, can get uh, very site specific, um, and and uh, that costs more money. So. Um, so talking just quickly about the code level uh, design, uh, ASC 7, in this case 716, uh, is uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what is typically used and that rolls into the International Building Code, at least here in the U.S. Um, you'll identify a site class uh, and you'll find your maximum considered earthquake and, and all these things are, are provided to you in the code. Um, and you can get your site-specific uh, design values based on that. Um, so just kind of looking at the, uh, uh, the, the, the map of Alaska, uh, you can see the Denali Fault is, uh, is in here, and then we're down here in, in Anchorage. Um, but uh, here, you, you pull off some uh, spectral values uh, from that, um, and uh, you get a, a design uh, response spectrum, or. Uh, uh, your design response spectrum, your maximum credible earthquake uh, spectrum, and, and a bunch of uh, design values. Um, then you'll uh, look at uh, your, your site class. And, uh, and you know, as we talked about before, uh, different stiffness sites, uh, for instance, that Loma Prieta earthquake, if you have a uh, rock versus uh, soft uh, soil, uh, you'll estimate uh, your site class to be uh, uh, one or the other. And, and from there, you can, you can provide uh, that information to the structural engineer and they can go about their, their merry way uh, designing the, uh, uh, the, the structure for, um, uh, for earthquake survivability, right, or, or lack of collapse. And again, so that's the, that's the code level. Now, if you're going to go to the next step, which is uh, what we're going to primarily focus on today, um, then you'll actually uh, start looking at uh, uh, defining or creating your own model of, uh, of the seismicity of, of uh, your, your region or your area. And, and so one, one question is, uh, you know, why would you do this? Um, and, uh, and the answer to that is maybe your, your model, and uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the 2007 Alaska model may not be up to date uh, and up to uh, scientific rigor um, uh, that, uh, that uh, we uh, were, were used to seeing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, the, the Alaska model versus uh, this, but uh, versus a, a, a more updated model. Um, but uh, we'll focus first on, you know, how do you do a probabilistic uh, seismic hazard analysis? So first, uh, you'll define your te uh, tectonic setting. Um, and then uh, uh, looking at the active faults and, and kind of the, the background seismicity, uh, you'll develop a seismic model um, and then uh, um, compile all your physical characteristics and then, and then run the model and look at the results. And so we'll just step through that uh, for uh, a project that, uh, that I worked on a, a few years ago. And what's interesting about this project is it actually uh, runs from uh, the north end of the state to the south end of the state. 
Um, and so it uh, passes through a number of uh, uh, physiographic regions and, uh, and you know, starts up here where we have uh, cold permafrost and, and the Brooks Range um, down into uh, the middle area where we have Fairbanks and, and uh, some fairly significant seismic hazards related to the Denali Fault and the Alaska Range here um, and, and another, a few other faults. And then down into Anchorage uh, uh, and, and a little bit south of Anchorage where we have uh, the subduction zone, we have the Castle Mountain Fault, we have a, a number of others. And so uh, this is uh, roughly 800 miles of, uh, of, uh, of a study. And, and what this study allowed us to do is essentially develop our own uh, hazard model of, uh, of the state of Alaska, if you will, because we were looking at uh, not just uh, uh, information right along the, the uh, route here, uh, but uh, beyond uh, the route to make sure that we're capturing all of the seismicity that, uh, that may impact uh, this infrastructure. Um, so, so just again, uh, you know, this is uh, another uh, map of uh, Alaska seismicity. And again, uh, we've got the subduction zone here uh, where uh, at about 55 millimeters a year, uh, the Pacific plate is subducting underneath the North American plate. And then we've also got uh, all this inter interior um, uh, seismicity as well. And, uh, and, and like I said, we've got a number of different uh, uh, zones that, uh, that we kind of broke this, uh, uh, this project into depending on the, the physiographic regions and the, the, uh, the tectonic setting um, and, and uh, along this 800 mile uh, route. Um, and so we'll just kind of zoom into each one of those uh, quickly and, and, uh, and look at uh, what those look like. So at, at kind of the northern end, uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, permafrost soil. Uh, and the permafrost soil uh, uh, behaves uh, similar, to, uh, similar to rock. Um, it's very stiff. Uh, material has a high shear wave velocity when it's frozen. Um, and it doesn't take much uh, for it to be, to be frozen. This is uh, about uh, 20 to 22 degree permafrost. Uh, so it's, it's fairly cold. Um, and then we do have a, a few faults offshore. Uh, but not, not a lot uh, going on here up in the Brooks Range. Um, and part of that uh, is that uh, we haven't until recently had very many seismic stations up here. So if there was a small earthquake in the background that occurred, um, we didn't have anything up here to, uh, to record it. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, the question is, uh, is, is this a, a fairly quiet area um, or is there, uh, you know, some rumblings here and there that, that happen more often than we uh, understand. And, and now we're, we've got a number of uh, seismic stations that have been installed um, in the northern portion of Alaska to help answer that question. But like I said, from that Schumigan Gap discussion, um, we're still, uh, still learning about the seismicity of Alaska. Um, then you get into kind of the central Alaska area. Again, we've got Fairbanks here um, and, and quite a few. We've got the Denali Fault um, and then a number of other, other faults. And then we've got this, uh, this shear zone here where uh, the soils are actually fairly deep. They're you know, 400 or so feet deep down to rock in these zones. And so you have these earthquakes that kind of trend in these, uh, 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 these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, shear ovals, if you will, um, and and uh, there's uh, some uh, significant earthquake activity, magnitude seven earthquakes that uh, that occur in this area, um, but there's no uh, there's no rupture uh, path at the at the surface, and so it's uh, it's one of the the interesting kind of challenges with uh, characterizing uh, the, uh, uh, the the earthquakes. And one thing I should point out too is you notice. You got these faults, and this, these are part of the Quaternary Fault and Fold database uh, that Alaska has compiled. But then you have these areas in between where you have these little dots of, of earthquakes occurring, and some of them are actually uh, related to uh, the subducting uh, Pacific Plate, and they're fairly deep. And others are, are shallow, but uh, but there's no. Sometimes there's not a, a fault to to tie these to when you're when you're doing a, a hazard analysis, and so. Um, you've got uh, uh, earthquakes that happen along a fault, and then you've got earthquakes that happen in this, uh, this open area. And so uh, in the uh, hazard analysis, we have to account for both. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at the, we'll characterize the faults, but we'll also characterize the, 
uh, the, the areas in between the faults that uh, we can still have, have earthquakes and, and kind of the, the background seismicity and uh, um, that. So one of, one of the in interesting things uh, in, so Alaska has this uh, 2007 uh, model of, uh, of the state of Alaska that's used in the building code. But there's a number of uh, areas along, along the, uh, uh, say along our route uh, for our project and and for other projects that I've worked on in the in the region, where some of the uh, some of the faults have not been uh, incorporated into the 2007 model, and part of that is you know the the lack of research um, at the time when when uh, and the lack of ability to characterize some of these things and include them, um, or their their kind of lack of understanding. And so, uh, from the 2007 model till now. Uh, you know, if you were doing a, a standard engineering design, your your model would not account for uh, the the higher than uh, than we'd anticipate earthquake activity um, in this in this region here, and we'll see that a little bit later about uh, some of the impacts of that. But uh, the northern foot, uh, uh, fold and thrust or foothills in the northern foothills fold and thrust belt, uh, NFFTB, uh, if you, if you will. Um, is is this uh, region uh, just north of the Denali Fault and uh, and south of those shear zones that I was describing, where you have a fairly significant uh, earthquake activity, or not significant, but you can have earthquake activity, um, but it's not a, not accounted for again in the 2007 model. Um, so uh, just kind of talking about the tectonic tectonic setting a little bit closer uh, to my home. Uh, here's Anchorage, Alaska. And the, the magnitude uh, 7.1 that we just had in 2018 was right about here. Um, and it was, uh, it was about uh, 40 kilometers, a little over 40 kilometers deep. Um, and so that was one of the real benefits of, uh, of uh, the, the depth of the, the plate, uh, the Pacific plate, is that, uh, that it was still, even when we were on top of the earthquake, it was still uh, 40 kilometers away. Um, which uh, you know uh, provided us, uh, you know, a uh, a little bit of uh, um, uh, a, a little bit less response than we would have had if, say, this was a magnitude 7.1 uh, close to the surface. So we've got uh, the Castle Mountain Fault, as I described earlier. Then we've got all these uh, uh, little fault systems uh, that uh, that have been observed uh, in the the Cook Inlet and. You know, these are shallow crustal uh, faults. And so even though they're not that big, they can still pop off an earthquake that can do uh, some fairly significant damage uh, to Anchorage. And so not only do we have the subduction zone uh, that's uh, underneath us, uh, but we also have these uh, uh, crustal faults as well. So when you're when you're uh, putting this all together, uh, you know we we live uh, with uh, tables, and and what we'll do is we'll characterize each of these faults, um, and there's a lot of research that uh, that goes into uh, pulling together all the the newest and latest uh, uh, research uh, on each of these fault systems because there's a number of things that we have to uh, to estimate uh, uh, when we're uh, when we're looking at that. So. Uh, fault type, uh, the fault length, the fault dip, the, uh, there's, uh, and, and how, then how sure are we of uh, that uh, 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 fault dip? So it, we do this uh, weighting scheme, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the logic tree in the next section. Um, but then, uh, and so there's a number of, uh, of, of characteristics that we will evaluate for, for each, of the, each of the faults. Uh, that uh, like we uh, say, for instance, this Castle Mountain Fault, uh, we would have uh, one uh, line item in the table for that one. And then uh, each of these little faults here, we'd have a line item uh, within the, the table uh, for each one of those. And those go into uh, the model. Um, so we use a, what's called a logic tree approach. <clears throat> and, and the logic tree essentially has a, a number of uh, and this ends up being actually more of a logic bush, uh, because if you look uh, closely here, uh, for instance, uh, the probability of activity, um, we have uh, um, uh, segmented versus, uh, uh, versus uh, uh, all the faults going together. So all the faults in an area going together. And then, then we go uh, low dip, uh, preferred dip, high dip. Um, and so these, uh, when we are talking about how sure we are, uh, the, the weighting 
uh, the weighting actually comes into here. And so then each one of these boxes has three more boxes. And then each one of these boxes has three more boxes. And, and you can see that uh, this uh, uh, logic tree, we, we look at the, the probability of uh, each one of these happening um, and, and then weight uh, the, the earthquake hazard ba based on uh, that probability of each one of these uh, aspects actually occurring. Um, and so, yeah, like you, like I said, uh, you know, logic tree may not be the right term and more of a logic bush because it, uh, it splays out uh, 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 fairly quickly. Uh, I mentioned uh, uniform sources as well. And so, so you take uh, all the earthquakes that you can't attribute to um, a, a fault specifically, and, and then you look for patterns uh, for those uniform sources. And then you, in the, the seismic hazard analysis, you include those uh, through again a, a logic tree, um, and and so the each area will be kind of weighted the same, and so you can see that this area here is a fairly quiet area. This is a fairly quiet area for seismic activity, um, uh, but then you get down into these, and we break these up into much smaller areas where we have uh, uh, some significant activity. And so we'll go through uh, the logic tree for uniform sources in similar ways. Um, where we account for uh, uh, for uh, the the different uh, level or different uh, potential for shaking, the different probabilities of of shaking, and then uh, one thing that I didn't mention before, but is uh, is really important, is the ground motion prediction equation. So at the end of the day, um, when you have all of this uh, this uh, these earthquake recurrence and and uh, and characteristics of the earthquake then you can actually start modeling the behavior. Um, and, and so that ground motion prediction equation, um, it's also called the ground motion model now, um, gives you uh, some, or it gives you the behavior as you go from, uh, if you remember way back at the beginning of the, of the presentation, the, the source to the path to the site. Um, and this, this, these equations capture uh, that behavior for all the different uh, earthquake types. Um, <clears throat> So once you have all of that uh, put together, uh, then uh, then you run the model and out pops a, uh, a, a hazard uh, 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 probability map. Um, and uh, on this map, I'm showing a number of different curves, and they're related to different uh, sources uh, for a, for a site. You have the the total hazard, uh, which adds up all all the hazards, and then you have this annual exceedance probability. So like we say. Uh, you know, ten percent in fifty years, and and uh, two percent in fifty years, or the four seventy five year earthquake and the twenty four seventy five year earthquake. Those are pretty common, um, and so you can you can then look at, and in this case is PGA. You can come up here and you can say, okay, we have 0.5 g um, at the twenty four seventy five year event, or if we were more interested in the the four hundred seventy five year recurrence, um, it would be closer to point uh, two. Uh, you know, 0.25 g. So, so this is uh, this is the output of uh, of that, and then uh, this is the annual exceedance probability again. And so, then you can choose what kind of risk you have. So, uh, typically, we we look at the 2475 year event, the two percent in 50 year um, event. Um, but if you were looking at a uh, uh, say a uh, mine structure that uh, that had to be uh, they're in uh, for for a long time. You might go to the the ten thousand year event, uh, or um, if you're in transportation, you're looking at the nine seventy five or thousand year event. So you'd be somewhere um, in there. So depending on what uh, what kind of structure you have, this gives you a lot of flexibility uh, to do that. Now, so these uh, these look really nice, and and they uh, uh, you know look like uh, you just pop off an answer here. The, the question is, you know, what's the uncertainty um, and, and what, uh, you know, what impacts uh, do all of the different uh, pieces or components have uh, for, uh, for the uh, modeling of uh, earthquakes? What do they have, uh, what impacts do they have on, on how comfortable we are, how sure we are of, of uh, say, this, this number here? Um, and so in order to uh, understand that, we do what's called uh, tornado plots where we, we uh, look at the uncertainty related to different elements uh, that, uh, uh, that we have included in our model, um, right? So we've got these GMPs or GMMs, the ground motion models, ground motion prediction equations. 
and they actually provide the, the more significant uh, uncertainty to our answer. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the key takeaways is, uh, is, you know, your, your uh, seismic hazard analysis is only as good as, uh, as your GMPEs um, and ground motion models. Uh, and so that's, a, that's kind of a, an interesting piece. So you know, if you look at the very bottom of this tornado plot, uh, the fault recurrence model. So if your seismologist, uh, engineering seismologist is, uh, is you know, pulling their hair out because they're really trying to understand uh, you know, what, the, what the recurrence is of, a, of an earthquake, um, you, can, you can tell them, well, it's not that big a deal, but maybe you should really focus on um, you know, what, uh, what the fault slip rates are um, and, and uh, try to do your best work there. So that's, that's kind of a, a nice plot to, to help you understand uh, the, the uncertainties of a, of a seismic hazard model. Um, for the, the 2007 model, um, I have the, the table here pulled from the Wesson et al. report. Uh, for the uh, ground motion models that, uh, that were utilized uh, in the 2007 model. And you can see that they're from 1997, uh, there's a 2003 uh, model, um, but uh, they're, they're actually a fairly um, uh, old ground motion uh, prediction models, ground motion models. Um, and uh, the 2007 model was mostly an update uh, from the 1999 model. Um, with, uh, with a few additions, including the 2002 Denali earthquake. Um, so, so one thing that uh, you see here is this is uh, actually a fairly old model. Um, we've had uh, significant improvements on the GMMs uh, with uh, NGA West or next generation attenuation uh, West and then followed on by uh, West 2 where they used even more earthquakes to uh, uh, develop uh, ground motion models. And now, uh, most recently in, in 2020, uh, the NGA subduction, so next generation uh, attenuation subduction model was released. And so, uh, you know, these, these provide, you know, some of the, the foremost understanding of, of how to uh, model uh, earthquakes um, for, for predicting uh, ground motions. Uh, and just to kind of highlight uh, how that's, uh, that's changed over time, um, here's a... Uh, uh, GMM development worldwide. Uh, so starting in the 1970s, 1960s, I uh, had uh, a few and then um, it uh, uh, has grown significantly over time. So if you look at the, the 2007 model, I uh, was using a 1990s uh, uh, version uh, GMMs, um, you know, there's roughly uh, 300 or so uh, models that, uh, that were, uh, were developed uh, uh, at that time, and now we're at, we're at over 600 models. And so depending on uh, what region you are in, you probably have an, a more updated model from 2007 than, uh, than we do now, or for the, uh, for the 2007 um, uh, hazard. Um, let's see, just a quick time check. All right, we're, we're doing, I'll speed up just a touch so we have a, a touch of time. Uh, so, so just to drive the, the point home, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, in the lower 48 states is what we call them in Alaska. So the, the contiguous states, um, there have been a number of, uh, of model rewrites or model redo redos <clears throat> based on updating uh, GMMs, among other information. And, uh, and there have only been two. Uh, this should be uh, uh, 1999, sorry. Uh, there have been two in, in Alaska, and the last one was quite a long time ago. Typically in the seismic hazard study world, we say that uh, these things have a shelf life of about five years uh, because the science again is changing so, uh, so rapidly in our understanding and, and of how earthquakes behave um, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is changing with time. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip uh, these next two slides uh, talking about uh, ground motion prediction equations in Anchorage and, uh, and move on uh, to a couple of other other points um, uh, that uh, that I wanted to just uh, drive home in the time that we have um, hazard deaggregation. I did a quick uh, just to show you the hazard of uh, of Champaign, Illinois. Um, you have the New Madrid uh, earthquake uh, 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 hazard zone that's uh, roughly 300 kilometers or so away from you, and then you have uh, some uh, some fairly uh, small faults that uh, are, are close to you as well that do have the, the hazard. If you look at the same plot for Anchorage, 
we essentially have that uh, significant subduction zone earthquake that really drives our uh, seismicity in, in Alaska. Um, you get time histories that you can then run into other models uh, from uh, these seismic hazard analyses. Uh, and, and so that's a, a nice output as well uh, from uh, performing a, a, a site uh, a hazard analysis. Um, but just to, just to highlight uh, the kind of the differences between the 2007 model and, and one of the recent studies that I was involved in, uh, the 2007 model, this is for PGA, um, running that, that 800 miles of, uh, of distance along that alignment that I showed you earlier, um, you have uh, some fairly significant differences. And this is that Northern Foothills fold and thrust belt uh, where you know, you, uh, the, the 2007 model, if you were going to design a building, would say that your PGA would be around uh, just over 0.4. But we estimate that it's uh, actually closer to a 0.8, uh, so twice uh, the seismicity, uh, twice the, the ground shaking uh, that, uh, that uh, the 2007 model uh, predicts. And so in, in different areas along that long alignment, uh, we actually have some significant differences in our recent model uh, to the 2007 model. I should say that USGS right now is uh, is fully funded to uh, redo the model with the uh, NGA subduction ground motion models out. Um, uh, that's uh, they're they're uh, working uh, diligently on that, um, but. Uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, and one of the benefits is uh, there aren't that many people that live in Alaska. So, you know, it, uh, compared to a, a, a significant urban environment, say like Los Angeles, you know, you're probably money per capita, you're, you're better off spending uh, uh, for looking at the seismic hazard in LA anyway. So uh, not, uh, I don't want to beat up on the USGS too much, but, uh, um, you know, we're, we're excited here in Alaska to see what they, they come up with uh, for uh, their updated model. Um, sometimes the USGS model is a bit coarser uh, than some clients need. And like I said, uh, there are some benefits to uh, doing more site-specific work. Uh, this is another example of a, another project that I worked on, where if you uh, were using ASC 710, um, uh, which is now ASC 716 for Alaska, same numbers, uh, you get 0.4G, and our study came up with 0.6G, and that's because we were incorporating uh, the most recent uh, information, um, and so a, a few other uh, ordinates on the on the frequency uh, spectrum there. Uh, so so just to, just to kind of wrap up here, uh, you know there there are even uh, further studies that you can do beyond uh, beyond uh, uh, course uh, hazard studies like uh, site specific ground response studies. Um, and uh, that's something that the uh, University of Illinois is well known for. So I, I wanted to just touch on that, just a, a, a touch to, to shout out there for all the work that's uh, being done on, on this aspect of, of life too. Um, but uh, you can use a number of tools from simple to complex for, for doing this. Uh, but uh, um, that, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a, a talk for another day. Um, and so I hope uh, that, uh, you were uh, able to get something from uh, from this discussion about uh, seismic hazard analyses and and how uh, that's performed and and what that actually uh, would mean for uh, for you um, and uh, and a, a good reason why it's important to update those uh, those seismic hazard analyses uh, regularly, especially for uh, you know support of the code. Um, with that, um, I. Um, uh, finished, uh, but uh, and, and I see that I've uh, used up pretty much the full amount of time. I don't know if we have time that we can use for questions, but I'm happy to uh, uh, to take any that have come in, Carl. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk and all the, I, I personally took a lot of key takeaways from it. Um, I'm sure many of us have. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions. If uh, anybody would like to unmute or put it in the chat, uh, you're more than welcome. So waiting for questions, I have one was particularly about the GMPEs. And so I was wondering when were the, the newest GMPEs for subduction zones before the new NGA, if I understood correctly, is coming out this year. So when were the previous ones made? Yeah, so there was a, there was a study for uh, a, a company called BC Hydro 
um, that had the, the most recent uh, ground motion prediction equations uh, that uh, uh, Norm Abrahamson and others had put together for, for BC Hydro. And so it's called the uh, BC Hydro model. And I think that came out in 2016. Um, and, and then there, there are a few other um, subduction zone models. Some of the challenges are related to the subduction zone models is uh, that uh, we know that big earthquakes happen, um, but they, they don't happen with uh, uh, regular enough frequency to really sharpen the, the stick on, on the uh, prediction of those uh, you know, those uh, earthquakes. And so, uh, you know, surprisingly enough, there's, there's not a lot of data, you know, we've, we've benefited from, uh, you know, the, uh, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake um, in Japan and, and, uh, and a few others uh, that have helped us uh, uh, add large earthquakes. You know, the 1964 earthquake uh, here in Anchorage, interestingly enough, there are no strong motion stations in Anchorage. And so there's no real recordings of that uh, that earthquake, um, and so you know we know that it, they're devastating, uh, but we don't uh, uh, you know we don't have a, a good sense uh, you know from a uh, uh, quantitative standpoint uh, you know how strong the shaking was uh, um, until until fairly recently. So. All right, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, if anybody has a final question that would they would like to squeeze in, please feel free to unmute or, chat, uh, or put it in the chat. Um, aside from that, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I would like to, to thank ERI uh, for uh, supporting us in, uh, in the logistics as well as in bringing Mr. Thornley to the IUC. I would like to thank GSO for all their help and collaboration and the geotechnical seminar series as well. And with that, thank you very much. And uh, thanks again, Mr. Thornley. Yeah, thank you so much for your, your time. And I look forward to uh, some of the follow on uh, later today. Definitely, definitely. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Right. Goodbye.